is something I shouldn't have to do. Normally I have some of those hits it before I do, but this family in town. I think that she's like the center of Goldtone. We, we call her Mama Goldtone. She's a go-getter. She's definitely made me personally want to be that way. She was really doing two things at once, running a business that turned into a multi-million dollar business and caring for us. She'll never get all the accolades she really deserves, but she's, with all her talent and hard work, I think it's gonna pay off in the end and she'll be rewarded. If you worked a third as hard as Robin did, <laughs> then you can keep your job. I think women have a much better chance of doing things. We've made our stand and put the line in the sand and it's like, okay, we are capable of doing this. But just because I'm a woman doesn't make me better. It's just give me a chance. That's all you're really asking. Let me have the exposure to do what I know I can do. This is either the box, I got two huge more boxes full of photos. Music was always present in our house. Mother always sang, played guitar, I mean it was always kind of there. Sun shines bright on Charlie Chaplin, something, something about a mosquito bites him. <laughs> uh, you are my sunshine, she used to play all that kind of stuff. And then my dad had his office in the basement when we lived in Ohio and he played uh, my Fair Lady and Sound of Music, and he had this little stereo system down there, and that's where he did his paperwork. If I picked up a baritone uke at age five and started playing, my mother showed me. So I've started that early, and I think it's just kind of like part of you, and so it was kind of a natural progression when I met Wayne, and we started playing music together. It was kind of like, well, this is fun. This is myself, and that's Wayne with a beard which was just not a good look there at that time. She had a accident with a guitar that needed to be repaired. We brought it to a uh, local music store, and when they looked at the guitar, and then I looked around the store, it was a majority band instruments. They really had no clue on how to fix this guitar. And that was the uh, first inspiration about the idea of opening a music store. When you start something, you don't know anything. That's the key. You're dumb. You start something like that, you're an ignorant person. And if you are so ignorant that you will not take the advice of people that have been there, have done it, maybe not the way you want to do it, but learn from their mistakes. Anybody that does anything like that, that they don't learn from other people's mistakes, you're gonna, you're, guess what? You're gonna make the same stupid mistake that they made. Back in the early, late 70s, early 80s, it was just a great time to be. I mean, music industry was a new, it was a frontier. Led Zeppelin, The Stones, Beatles. I mean, there were so many different bands with different styles. So it was a, probably the best time to start off. We got lucky. So with um, no credit history and no collateral, we visited uh, seven or eight banks, and they were very polite, but at the end of the conversation, it was, we really can't help you guys out much. You don't have any experience, you don't have any collateral. You know, I think when I was starting out, I, would, I don't think I would have made the effort to go to a bank. It was bad enough with Wayne and I together with our, in, I think it would have been really tough. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, uh, one of the banks gave us a call. Now that was scary, because now this dream was going to be a reality, and it was, that was, that was a kind of a scary part. It was like, uh-oh, okay. Let's do this. It was a complete surprise, and we even took it as maybe some good karma, you know, if all of a sudden they gave us a loan out of nowhere, then maybe we're doing the right thing. <laughs> oh, boy, you know, starting out in the, in the music business or just any business, you have to have the carrot dangling. You have to know what your goals are. I think if anybody goes in without a goal, you're pretty much doomed. We attempted to grow too fast. We started another storefront in Merritt Island, and I think with that, even though we thought, I mean, it made sense because we were pretty much maxed out in Titusville. We figured, why don't we just duplicate what we're doing in Merritt Island? Uh, the problem is, is Merritt Island's too close. People were coming as far as Melbourne, which is an hour away. They were coming from Orlando, they were coming from Daytona. So we just kind of didn't figure that out. We were going to buy bulk and then distribute it through the two 
businesses, but when you don't have hands-on, which it takes, especially establishing a business in a new area, you have to, we just didn't have enough energy to split ourselves in that many directions. And that's, that's why we failed at that. We had a record in tape, kiosk that we wanted to franchise and probably would have if the mall situation didn't change. So we invested a lot in that and that didn't work all that well. But if you can kind of go, oh yeah, I can see where that could happen. Let's not go there. I think that's a, another key because every mistake you make is costing you money. Plus, when we were starting out, you had albums, and then you had albums and eight tracks, and at one time you had albums, eight tracks, and cassettes. So you had all this stock that was, you know, and, and the, it was the, the interim that was tough, and that's why we kind of stopped with the LPs. Although I loved it because we always had the latest music. Uh, that was probably selfish on our part. We didn't want to give that up. I mean, you're always going to run into the wall. It's just, can you figure out how to go under it, around it, uh, over it? That makes for a longevity of a, of a business. You can't give up. You just don't let yourself give up. We, we kind of laugh when we look back, but our first opening hours were, were from 10 in the morning to 9 o'clock on um, Monday through Friday, and I think we closed at six o'clock on Saturday. And then we played music at a local Best Western Friday and Saturday night. And the only day we really had off was Sunday. And at that time it was doing laundry and house cleaning and you know, trying to get through life. My father was in his business, he was a plumber and he was in his own business. So as a young person, I realized what it took to make a living and feed a family in the world of business. It, it was a lot of long hours, so the sacrifices that the whole family makes when you own a business is something that occurs just because of the amount of time it takes to be successful. There's the babes. That is Lindsay, at probably age, she's probably maybe three there, and Mandy's probably around two. I was working when I had the children, I had to step back, so I did a lot of band repair at home in the evenings and early in the morning when they were sleeping. Uh, these two little girls were back to back 15 months apart. And the kids would come in with me too. We were a family unit and they understood that. Very family oriented town Titusville is. We we're heading from our home site to our daughter and son-in-law's home, which is in the same complex, which is nice. So that's a good thing for a grandma. Dude, are you into a swing? <gasps> Where are you going? <laughs> well, my mom has never taken a break. She works, works, works. It's very inspiring, especially now that I have kids, because, you know, when you're younger, you don't really understand what your parents put in to, you know, give you a good life. Growing up with parents that own a small business was a lot of time spent at the business. Um, after school, weekends, um, where homework was done here, uh, dinners were served when we got home a little bit later, so it's kind of affected the way that I am now. I eat a little bit later, I'm fine with working a little bit later. She helped start the business, she put a lot into the business every single day, but it didn't mean that she put caregiving second. She really taught me that you can do anything. I mean, this woman can change a toilet and tar a roof. You know, and it really gives, I think, my sister and I inspiration to um, do things as women and learn how to do things. So she really taught me that, that women can do anything because she can do anything. This is the shed. <laughs> People brought their instruments from all over to us to repair. And that was kind of like how Gold Tone came because we knew we could do this. We knew we could build a product just because of the years of experience we had with putting violins and guitars and the other acoustic instruments together. When the uh, Pacific Rim folks got into making affordable instruments, they made great, great guitars, they made great electric guitars, they made great keyboards, they made great mandolins, but for some reason, um, they just, forgot about banjos. Uh, this is the TB100. This is the first banjo that we came up with. 
and I never had heard of a travel banjo that was being made and, and sold, so we came up with this idea of a uh, travel banjo with a shorter size neck and a smaller size body. We started making these in the back of the shop, selling them in the store, and then we sent one away to a um, magazine called Banjo Newsletter, and they gave it an incredible review, and all of a sudden we started having stores call us. And when we built the shed, it was kind of like a way of saying this is something that's going to happen. For a company of our size, we have an enormous amount of famous people playing on our instruments. Kid Rock and Bruce Springsteen, uh, Mumford & Sons, if you've heard of them, uh, their first album was all gold tone instruments. Never thought love had a rainbow on it. Used to think a cloud was a nightmare. That was up until when I first met you. Now I roll around hoping you can. Dance, dance, feel it all around you. Dance, dance, dance. Bela Fleck. I mean, Bela, probably, I mean, he's very particular in what he does. He's one of the best in the world, if not the best. And to, to, to get with Wayne to produce a banjo was a real honor for us. I mean, that was a real coup because he was willing to work with us. And we're a small little family organization, and he knew we would could do a good job on his banjo, and that was great. We were the first company that actually produced great sounding low-end banjos and we tried to produce something in the uh, two to three hundred dollar price range. One of the things people don't understand about banjos is you can buy a $65 or $75 guitar because they're made all, all, all out of wood and the wood in a $70 guitar is probably about $15 worth of wood on a banjo. Uh, we can never get down to that $99 price range just simply because of all the metal parts in the banjo. Metal's much more expensive than wood. Just in necks and bodies alone, just in metal parts alone, screws, uh, hooks, tail pieces, machine heads, uh, you're always going to get parts from somewhere else. They're not all going to be manufactured in the United States because they simply are too expensive. If you want to pay the prices you're used to paying in this country, then this is going to be an issue. It's going to be very difficult to make these things in this country because you have taxes and you have wages and health insurance and it's just, it's what it is. We also had an ebony situation with the, the dots on our, the position markers on the necks we were fined really heavily, and there was a time when we thought they were going to take strings or gold tone away from us because, you know, they're saying for every shipment that you've ever shipped out in the past since you've been in existence, if you didn't file and, and bring it into this certain port, we were going to, this is how much you should be paying. And it was millions. Our factory that we received from sold made everybody's banjos, and we were the only ones that were fined. And that's where I find that's a little bit unjust. We actually went to Louisville and we, we got in front of the people that were going to have the Fish and Wildlife and we said, okay, plead ignorance, because we were ignorant. It, there's no way we would have ever done anything if we had known that's what we needed to do. It doesn't, it makes no sense to do that. Uh, they gave us a little bit of time to pay it off, which was good. They didn't hit us all at once because that would have been devastating. That would have cleaned out. And when you were the only one doing it and filing these papers and the competitors aren't doing it, you're just, you lose, we lost a lot of our high-end business because of that. Or we just paid it and made less money. Hi, welcome to 2017 NAM show here in Nashville, Tennessee. And we're at the Gold Tone booth. My name is Justin, and I'm going to walk you through a few of our products here at NAM. This is an electric banjo, six string. This is a, a Paul Beard signature series. So, this is the micro bass. It is, like I said, our top selling product. And out of the 150 pieces that we manufacture, uh, we sell this one 
five to one to our next top selling product, which happens to be the F6 guitar. Uh, NAM is probably one of the most important things we do as far as the show's concern. Um, what it enables you to do is all the dealers actually come to you. You bring in your products, so you're bringing in the new products, some of the standard older products that a new dealer might be interested in. But the one thing that I've always capitalized in trade shows, and it's been my main reason of going, is just walking around the trade show and looking and exploring and trying to come up with other ideas. It's the people that you meet. We can go to the actual builders of guitars, heads of factories from different countries. NAM is probably where we met most of the people that we deal with. It's comforting to know that your problems and your successes uh, are shared by uh, other individuals. So a lot of times you think in a, um, in a business that you are really in control and you're, you're really the only um, person on the map, but once you get to these trade shows and find out that um, it's a whole group that is causing the movements and causing either successes or failures, um, you just have a better understanding. Okay, what? You can get some work now. When we had any extra money, we bought more inventory. Our way of thinking of investing, because you weren't making any money if you had it sitting in a bank, so if we keep investing in us and in our product, eventually that product was going to go up for us. There are costs, and if we had still a lot of uh, warehousing full of our product, it was better than money in the bank, and luckily we did that because uh, there was a CITES, uh, a Rosewood incident that happened last year, the end of last year. Uh, back in October, the World Organization for Saving the Trees got together and they came up with a new regulation, which meant that um, you had to have certain licensing to transport Rosewood internationally. The problem with it was, is no one realized how long it would take to recover from it. And when you have a business such as ours that has employees 20 people, it, it, it's, it's a def definite impact. If it had rosewood and every one of our fingerboards had rosewood, you had to have these certain licenses. And so as of January 2nd, we couldn't ship out of country and we couldn't receive any stock. Now this came about because of the Chinese furniture companies and they were soaking up all the available rosewood all over the world, making furniture out of it. It really didn't have any cost to do with the music industry because we use so little rosewood. A rosewood tree could probably make a thousand fingerboards where it may only make um, a dozen pieces of furniture. So unfortunately for us, they gave very, very little time to comply. And then there was such a demand for businesses involved in, with rosewood which included knife makers and musical instrument makers. Uh, there was such an enormous attempt to get these new licenses that the government agencies just couldn't keep up with us. So that was my biggest beef with um, the way that the government handled it and the way that we had to suffer um, really for no need at all if they had done uh, some sort of research. I think just the bureaucracy of the machine is what really was harmful. And a lot of the Chinese factories and a lot of the music business, they closed their door because they couldn't sustain months of having no, no exports. Well, you know, Wynn and I are getting to that point in our lives where um, these hurdles become a little bit much to get over the next one. We're kind of like, you know, <laughs> I need a boom truck to get me over this one because I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna work to get there. This is a family business. Our daughters, our son-in-law, my brother. We, we, we can't walk away from this. This is not something we walk away from. This is something we pass on. I would like to see my parents retire, um, possibly running it with my brother-in-law and keeping it in a family, as a family business. I would love for Goldtone to be the top of the bluegrass and folk, at the top of the totem pole. We just opened a distribution company with 11 new countries, 
yeah, we're going to have um, 2,200 new stores. Obviously, the retail side of things is taking a different route, you know, with the all the internet sales happening right now, and and we're losing a lot of strong mom and pop representation. That's that I think is really the the drive for the music industry, and I think we're going to lose uh, just a specialness that was there with that. I'm not certain if it's an innate uh, part of your mind. Um, I just know that uh, there's certain people, uh, a good percentage of people, that find playing a musical instrument is very, very comforting. It's not all electric, it's not all digital. It's This is a vibrating body that creates pretty harmonies and... No matter how good you get, there is always something to learn. That's part of the excitement. Every time you learn a new lick or a new song, uh, you feel like you've accomplished something. I want to keep this going because I think it's a really, it would be a sad thing if, it, if these instruments weren't in, out there for people to enjoy. Thank <laughs> you,